So we like making things because we're engineers. When we make things, then our goal is then to make something happen. And for all the kinds of things that I've shown you, we do this by using the basic idea of a market. And with apologies to the economics fellows here, let me try lecture one of um, the audition before you even come to Cambridge on economics. Everything that we make is uh, an entrant into a market. And in the market, there's some demand. As the price goes down, more people want to buy it. And there is a supply. So as the price goes up, more people want to make it. So at some point, we reach an equilibrium of pricing. And the kinds of inventions that we're involved in either have to uh, create new benefits so that people are prepared to pay more for the same quantity of goods, or they've got to reduce the costs in order to make it more attractive uh, to reach the goods. And either way, uh, the equilibrium point where the supply meets the demand moves to the right, and that implies increased satisfaction. So everything that we do as engineers is to invent and make things and then to deliver them into a market with the goal that economics and the whole system of business innovation and policy support uh, will deliver the mechanism to bring them about, to make them happen. The enthusiasts for markets, and here's one representative of them, say what's good for the people is best known to the people themselves and they express their preferences by spending. So we should leave the market to be as free as possible so that people can express their free choice. Governments should try not to override their choices because governments make bad decisions on behalf of the people. Um, and governments should only uh, apply rules to ensure that the rules of the market uh, operate fairly. So that's what the proponents, and as we know, this works really, really well. Uh, so it comes up with trustable business leaders. Uh, sometimes they wear handcuffs. And uh, they uh, obviously are well-regarded societal figures, and they're people that we can invest in with confidence. So there are, in fact, some concerns about this approach. Uh, one is, for example, that um, the uh, people don't make a free choice because advertising distorts the way that they make decisions. Another one is that markets promote inequality. Very obviously, they're unstable. Once you have, then you have the uh, ability to acquire more of the means of production, uh, so they become instantly unstable or polarizing towards rich and poor. Um, and quite clearly, larger corporations have more influence over government in setting the rules. That's very clear, for example, by the presence of the uh, oil and gas industry at the COP26 negotiations. So there's a balance there between the enthusiasms which have some reality about them and the concerns which very definitely have some reality. But this, is, this idea of the market is what determines the way that business strategy is set. So within business, innovation is seen as the engine of growth. Uh, companies innovate to try and move themselves towards having an advantage and ideally having a monopoly. Monopoly sounds like it's something that we try and avoid, but of course Microsoft have in effect created a monopoly over word processing software. So they're able to keep ramping up their tremendous profits as a result of it. So companies try to create monopolies, and their logic is that growth comes out by borrowing money to accelerate the rate at which they can bring innovations to the market. And therefore, politicians uh, aiming to support uh, companies say that policy should be good for jobs, bills, and growth. Therefore, innovations that cause companies to grow are the right thing for policies to support. And governments should fund research, development, innovation, the sort of thing that we do here, and the chains that take our innovations into business in order to support early sales before markets can take over and deliver. And that is the logic of how make, we make things happen. The conventional, if you like, innovation, markets, economics, politics chain, which tells us how things happen. But in this lecture, I want to focus specifically on good things. And I almost like to leave that open as to what the definition of a good thing is. But the United Nations put a lot of effort into defining them for us, and here they are. Here are the, um, the 17 defini defined good things, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Um, because I'm an engineer, I don't have a good memory, and 17 is too many for me to be able to process. And if you're able to read them, you'll see that the middle row there, apart from number 10, the middle row looks awfully like big business got involved in defining what these are. So I really get the idea of dealing with inequalities. But whether that means industry, innovation, and infrastructure seems to me to be up for grabs. 
So I'm going to rule out the ones that I think have been commercially motivated. Um, number 16 is world peace, and that is an aspiration that we all have. It came up in, I think, the first ever book, The Epic of Gilgamesh, and we've been looking for it ever since. But if we predicate everything else on achieving world peace as well, it may be the statistics show that we won't get there, so we'll rule that one out. Number 17 and the bottom right seem to me to be logos and not anything that anybody actually can aspire to, so we'll get rid of them. And when I read the top row, actually, poverty, hunger, education, gender equality, these are all versions of inequality. So if I just leave it at reduced inequalities, I think I haven't taken anything away. I've just summarized what we mean by inequality. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm not very good at biology. So if I combine 14 and 15, I think what we're after there is species diversity. So that's reduced me to having three good things, and I can remember what they are. So they are um, inequality, uh, climate, uh, a safe climate, and conservation species or eco-diversity. So are markets delivering on our requirement for these three good things? We know how to make things. We know how to make things happen. Are they delivering on these good things? Well, here is the World Inequality Report from last year. And what this shows is the y-axis is wealth here. So that's the total value of stuff that you own uh, for the world's population. Now, if you can read the number, then this number here, 500,000 euros, is the average house of a price in Cambridge. So on average, if in this room you own a house in Cambridge, you're in the top 3% of the world's wealth. Um, probably by default, all of us are close to uh, the top 10% because of a lack of uh, diversity in our intake over here. I don't know the statistics on that. Um, that figure is absolutely amazing. That is a function of markets that once you have, you're able to uh, control the means of production and have this enormous tale uh, of uh, poverty or relative lack of wealth, um, which we are all comfortable living in. We are all essentially in the top 3 to 5% of that graph. Um, and if you think about it, um, the United Nations report on hunger says that 10% of the world's population regularly cannot access one meal per day. That's their definition of hunger. And we here are absolutely comfortable living with that. That doesn't wake us up giving us nightmares every day. So this curve, because we are so well up it, is one that we don't notice. It's become, uh, we've become acclimatized to it. But actually, that is horrific. If we saw that happening here, I don't think we would be sitting in the lecture. I think we would be going out and taking action if we were physically involved in it. However, we, and nobody else like us, actually feels that we're wealthy. You could always have a bigger boat. And it's a rather odd feeling of this graph that quite nobody here, maybe apart from the last five, actually feels that they are in the wealthy bracket because there's somebody else. We compare ourselves to our peers. Uh, rather than to others. So we can say with some confidence that markets are not delivering our first good thing of equality. What about a safe climate? Well, this graph shows the history of the world's uh, 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 equivalent CO2 emissions, that's the basket of all greenhouse gases together, since we signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was the moment that we agreed to reduce the emissions. And you can see we've been very busy having meetings. Uh, I was uh, an author on that one. Um, and they keep going, and we're trying to lobby each time it comes around for COP26. But so far, there is no evidence that talking about it, that markets, that the processes by which we make decisions, by which we make things happen, are delivering any progress on the climate at all. Now, these are, just have to check my notes, birds. Yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> don't come up in engineering very often. And I'd like you to do a little bit of a thought experiment on this. This is thinking about species diversity. I'd like you to imagine all the birds in the world. That's all of them. I don't just mean all the types of bird, but every single one of them. If you imagine that there are 25 million flamingos, then imagine 25 million flamingos and the blackbirds and the other ones, whatever they're called. Now, line them all up by weight, and I want you to cut off that population of birds at 
Okay, have you got that in your mind? All the words in the world, and I want 60% of their mass. And the picture I've given you here is, I'm afraid, slightly misleading. I'll now correct the picture. 60% of the birds in the world are chickens by mass. And that is a reflection of where we've got to in species conservation and biodiversity. So we know how to make things. We know how to make things happen. But it appears that having reduced good things to three, we aren't actually making very much progress on good things. Why not? Within the country, our government exists partly in order to target the first of those, but within the boundaries of the country. I find this picture very helpful, and I think it ought to be in the newspaper every single time any political discussion comes up. On the left is where the UK government gets its money, and on the right is where it spends it. And you can see various forms of tax over here, and the spending on the right is largely to do with inequality in British society. So that's good. Within the country, we have got a mechanism to try and reduce inequality uh, to some extent within the UK. However, we spend less than a percent of our uh, spending on people being poor anywhere else. And of course, most of the poor people are somewhere else. You know that we halved that in uh, the last year or so. Um, and the threat of climate change and biodiversity or loss of biodiversity simply aren't seen as a threat to domestic security and safety by the government, uh, but they are seen as a risk to income. And that means that the government's current approach to those two good things, uh, and indeed to international inequality, is that we have to deliver it through markets. So we need to make things, and we need to deliver them through markets in order to create growth uh, through delivering innovation. That's the political view of how we deliver those good things. So, what might we invent? Well, with the area of inequality, ever since I was a student, the world's big charities have been trying to deliver efficient wood burners to uh, developing uh, economies. Wood is, uh, use in developing economies is by far our least efficient use of energy. Uh, burning wood on open fires wastes almost all of the heat value that you could get out of the wood. But still, even after tens of millions of demonstration stoves of different types have been tried, we haven't solved the problem. We haven't found a way of bringing an efficient stove that's nurtured within the culture uh, that it could be made, uh, that, that it can be sustained. Um, we do know how to make more fresh water, provided we've got a nuclear power station spare. It takes a great deal of energy to take the salt out of wa uh, water. On the island of Malta, uh, survives on desalinated water by using a huge fraction of its energy bu budget to take salt out of water. So there is a technology option, but it won't be a very easy one to scale unless we scale our global energy supply by much more than we have. In the area I know most about, then of course I'm surrounded by engineers innovating in the hope that they will solve climate change. And they are egged on by the whole political process, hoping that the innovation markets economics politics chain will work Every new country that gets it with climate change immediately announces that they're going to uh, increase their innovation funding. That's happened in every single country that has signed up to any kind of climate pledge. And only three big things have changed. So wind turbines that were developed in uh, Denmark in the early 1970s have now reached nearly 5% of total electricity generation. That's electricity, not energy. Um, but they are now growing at a steady rate. Solar cells also are beginning to grow at a steady rate. We've got through that period of development. I still have my school calculator powered on solar cells, so they're not that new, but we've scaled them and we now know how to bring them into the system. Um, and electric cars, it looks like we're on track for that. Whether the politics holds firm, we don't yet know. Uh, but the one really good bit of legislation passed about climate change was to ban uh, internal combustion engine cars uh, from 2030 onwards in the UK, the sales of new ones. So those three are going well. However, my colleagues around the world of engineering and their junior uh, subspecies in physics uh, are inventing things all over the place. So we've got carbon capture and storage, the comfort blanket of climate policy. It's very British. If we don't like it, you brush it under the carpet. And so far, we've innovated at a tremendous rate, and it's reached 0.08% of global emissions, and it's growing at 0.004% per year. 
Um, this is Bill Gates' excuse for continuing to fly, is to use a nuclear power station to power fans that take the CO2 out of the air. Um, and we've done an estimate on that based on the propaganda of the people who sell it, which says that if you use this powered by a gas-fired uh, electricity generation station, uh, if you use all the electricity, uh, sorry, if you use two-thirds of the electricity, you would be able to capture all of the gas, the CO2 produced by the power station. But nobody's proved it at scale yet, so we don't know. Um, this is the control engineering solution. Uh, there's no problem about climate change. All we need is a big umbrella at the right position between the earth and the, um, the sun, and then we can turn up the shading as we require it. And people in this university have looked me in the eye with a straight face and said, that's the answer, there's no problem. Um, this is what Bill Gates was promoting at the Mission Innovation launch in 2015. It's inflatable uh, wind turbines that go very high because the wind is stronger higher up. Uh, the two companies he invested in are no longer trading, I checked recently. And this is the magic word of hydrogen. Hydrogen is a terribly useful gas, but we haven't got any of it. And to make green hydrogen, you either need a huge amount of electricity or you need carbon capture and storage. And we haven't got any spare of either of them. So what we know about that is that there's lots of innovation, but it's pretty unlikely that it's going to come about. I don't know the area of, uh, what are they called? Uh, bird conservation very well. I did a Google search and discovered that you can buy a digital bird feeder that recognizes what type of bird it is and gives the food out or not, depending on what type of food uh, bird you want to have in your garden. So it won't be long before somebody says that if we tied this up with artificial intelligence, sufficient of these bird feeders will deliver species conservation around the world. I can almost hear the funding proposal going in for computer guaranteed biodiversity. In the area where I know best, there are two reasons why we're very concerned about this approach. Um, the first is that it's very easy when you're talking about a technology to talk about its benefits without thinking about the overall system. And we're working on a calculator that will be in the public domain by the end of the year, which says whatever the country or the world's goods it, demand for goods and services are, they're delivered by some sectors which depend on fuel or electricity. And if they cause emissions, then, and we want zero emissions, we need to have a negative emissions technology. And whatever fuel you have, it has to come from either biomass or from other solar renewables from non-emitting electricity. That's where your electricity comes, and negative emissions either require carbon storage or growing more biomass or more emissions-free electricity. So all climate policy plans in the world depend on these three resources. And it, therefore, we can predict what we've got available by looking at the rate at which these grow. Um, after COP26, the one that was in Glasgow, I had the lead opinion piece in the Financial Times next day to point out that the uh, policy program that was discussed at COP26 required um, uh, eight times more non-emitting electricity than we have today and 600 times more carbon storage than we have today. And there is no possibility that we're going to grow that in the amount of time available. Um, so the whole dis meeting had discussed a solution space that we know we can't possibly get into. Um, we know something about deployment rates because we know from the past that even when these are profitable, introducing new energy technologies is slow. There is no S-curve. They're not like iPhones. That may be a surprise to those of you who aren't in engineering. Um, but an iPhone and a nuclear power station differ in several respects including the fact that to build a nuclear power station, you need land rights, you need government funding, you need legal compliance, you need public consent, uh, you need a whole range of safety systems, etc., etc. Hinkley Point C, if it arrives on schedule, will have taken 22 years from political commitment to when it opens. But the last time they announced a delay, they did say they would be announcing future delays. Um, I met the person in the Treasury who's in charge of the Sizewell C project uh, earlier uh, this year. And she said that she tried everything she could and she couldn't work out how Sizewell C could generate by the end of the 2030s. And we can't either. It's not just construction. It's all the other public discussion that has to happen on the way. So these two problems of aggregation, adding up the total requirements and deployment rates, the rate at which we can build large infrastructure, are stopping the new technology solutions in climate mitigation. 
So it seems to me that we're living in a way that we are singing our song while blindfolded. We recognize these three good things that we want, but we've become accustomed to them. We're familiar with the idea that 10% of the world is hungry. That's okay, we don't really worry about it. We know climate change is going on, but we also want a new bicycle for Christmas. And whether we're going to uh, think about one or the other, well, it's a trade-off, isn't it? There's a limit to how gloomy we can be thinking about something like climate change. Uh, it's become familiar. Um, biodiversity, um, it's something we've heard about for so long. It doesn't sort of strike us between the eyes. We don't feel, gosh, we've actually got to act on it. We should just talk about it a bit more over dinner. It is, however, urgent. One of our PhDs who finished last year did this analysis on food production. This is in Pakistan. She did it globally. Uh, the data shows the crop productivity for different square kilometers over the whole of Pakistan. Can, on, here is the average temperature in that square kilometer over the year. And here is how much crop was grown. And you can see that the curve peaks at about 13 or 14 degrees. And that over time, that's 1960, 2000, 2020, the curve rises up as we get more irrigation and more fertilizer. However, what's now happening is that as the temperature in Pakistan is rising, then uh, it doesn't really matter how much better we get at irrigation and fertilizer, crop productivity isn't going to be able to keep up. So we know that Pakistan is not going to be able to grow enough food to sustain itself by the end of the century, but it may not be able to afford to buy it either. And if we play this out in the, uh, assuming that we continue to not act on climate change in the way that we're not acting at the moment, the figures are absolutely horrific. Uh, over a billion people are at risk of starvation uh, if we continue not to act. So it really is urgent, even though it's rather tiring and it's familiar and we'd rather think about something uh, more exciting. So it looks like conventional innovation markets economic politics isn't going to deliver the three good things. They aren't priced. We've had various policy attempts to put prices on them, but they're really difficult because you need a global police force to check that the price here is the same as the price somewhere else to avoid uh, somebody getting away with it. There's been a big debate over 20 or 30 years now about whether we could have border tax adjustments so that you can't import an unfairly emitting uh, substitute for something that's made with low emissions in your country, and we're yet to get anywhere near to the politics of making that work. We don't have a functioning carbon price, uh, except in particular uh, areas, but with exclusions. The steel industry, one of the top two emitters of industry, pays no carbon tax uh, anywhere um, because it would be unfair on them. Um, we have grown accustomed to these problems, so we don't recognize them as threats. We like regulation, and eventually all three of these issues are health and safety problems, but we haven't yet been asking for regulation in these areas. Oddly, that's where the electric car legislation came from. The public was concerned about diesel particulates on Oxford Street that built into a momentum against diesel uh, engine cars, and suddenly the market plummeted for that, for diesel engine cars, and the car makers who'd invested heavily in making diesel cars needed security for the future. So they themselves then lobbied for electric powertrains so they couldn't get caught out in future. So that's a great example of regulation hen um, helping us. And of course, given these apparently enormous problems that seem so far off as if our own actions are so small, our instinct is to spend on things that have more immediate benefits rather than things that act on these big problems. I've been speculating on this. The, we take the week and every... Uh, week it arrives, I have to edit some of the photos in case I see the worst Prime Minister we've ever had. Um, and it struck me it would be really interesting if somebody produced a newspaper which reported the consequences of the inaction of current business and political leaders. Because if you think about the past five Prime Ministers, how many we've had in the last year, let's extend it seven and go back five years, or how many it takes to get to five years, and the next two or three, between them, they will be responsible for a load of inaction that really comes back to bite us. And we already know the consequences of that. It would be good to hold them to account in a more effective way. Well, if that sounds gloomy, over 20 years of working in this area, I have discovered only one joke about climate change, and it's here, uh, enacted for you in cartoon form. Two planets meet in outer space, and one of them says in a friendly way, hi, how are you doing? 
And the other one says, oh, it's not so good. I've got humans. And the third one says, oh, I had them. Don't worry. They go away on their own, and they don't last long. <laughs> the planet is fine. The planet's going to go on. Various species are going to go on. The only question is whether humans go on, and we're on a course of definitely getting rid of humans pretty quickly, and I really mean that, not as a sort of rhetorical point, but the evidence that we've been looking at says that we really won't be uh, having humans around for uh, maybe only a couple of hundred years before we've got rid of 90% of them. It's at that sort of scale uh, that we're talking. Um, but the planet will be fine, so we can relax with that. And that really gets us to the heart of where we're trying to get to in this lecture. If that conventional innovation, market, economics, politics won't deliver good things, then what will? Well, some good things do happen, so we can relax at least with that. And here's a great and inspiring uh, start with two people who embodied a societal change. And I think they embodied it because they lived it. They had an integrity because it was sacrificial. And by being inside the change that they were calling for, they created an absolutely mom momentous societal change, uh, both of them, so that we know that that is possible. We know that good things have happened in the past, um, for example, led by faith organisations, the foundation of the Church of England schools and hospitals that were the foundation for the welfare state in the UK. Um, the, Charter, the United Nations Charter on Human Rights was a multi-faith organisation with Jewish, Christian and Muslim people working with Eleanor Roosevelt uh, to come up with something fundamental to uh, a fundamental good thing. And more recently, the phrase living wage is now common to us and has become common currency in college decision makings even. And it was the outcome of a working group, a joint Christian Muslim working group in London, trying to address inequality in a practical way. So faith-based organizations have had a good effect in bringing about some good things. We can't say they have sold everything or that they've been exemplary. And of course, around them, the charities that they've set up and a wider range of charities do many good things. I have to put a slight damp cloth on it though, unfortunately, because this graph, I heard this anecdotally and went and checked the data. As a country, we are consistently spending double the amount on pet food that we spend on charity. So we can do it, but we just don't do it very much relative to the scale of the problems we're dealing with. What about philanthropy? You can only take your hat off to people who have given away such a gigantic amount of their wealth but I think it leaves me with a slight feeling of democratic dis-ease that an individual can acquire so much wealth and therefore have so much choice about what they do with it. In the case of Bill Gates, I admire him so much for his generosity. And the only criticism is that he thinks that climate change has to be solved by technologies. Uh, he says, nobody will change their behavior, therefore it has to be technology, as if those were the only two options. They fundamentally aren't. The two are linked, the way that we use technology is a behavioural choice and vice versa. So using technologies differently is within our reach. It's not a binary choice. Carnegie, uh, I have no idea how to weigh it up, but every time you go to America, uh, you meet some of Carnegie's legacy in all of the gifts that he gave. There are other examples. There's cooperatives um, at different scales. Um, in the media, the good life, for those of you at my age and older, will remember this magnificent programme from the 1970s with Penelope Keith, who is still around, uh, the Archers was, it was created partly to share ideas about good things with farmers. And just to spread the span of our cultural references during the talk, Love Island has been having a big effect on second-hand clothing sales by making the point that, I can't remember which way around it is, and I'm never going to watch the thing to find out, but either they only wore things they bought on eBay or everything they wore then got sold on eBay. But apparently it's had a huge effect on eBay sales of clothing. Uh, and when I was thinking about preparing the talk, uh, I was in the lakes and my daughter found me a can of good things happen. So it is true that good things happen and that's in the fridge for later on tonight. But really, the heart of what I'm saying is that the good things we're after require that the wealthy, the top five, three, ten percent, whatever number we choose, have to exercise restraint. There isn't an innovation, political, wealth-generating mechanism to deliver good things with the level of wealth inequality that we have. And that's where I wanted to get to in this talk, because restraint is a topic that can't be discussed in politics. It doesn't sit in economics, naturally, because it isn't to do with the growth of income metrics. 
and yet without it, we're probably looking at the end of the human species. Let me give you an idea of what I mean about restraint. These are aeroplanes. They're a bit like birds, but they've got motors in them. Um, there are around us thousands and thousands of researchers working on sustainable flight, and you can get lots of money on it, and I'm afraid the king was probably conned in making his first visit after the coronation to an activity in Cambridge claiming to build, be part of the sustainable aviation future. You can build a plane powered by solar cells, but that takes one lightweight person. The wing area required in order to make uh, an aeroplane fly is impossible. You can't have a solar plane, plane with enough people in to make it work. You can build battery-powered planes, and there are a few groups doing it with short-haul, small planes. By the end of this decade, a few of them will have flown a short distance. Nobody in the world is developing long-haul battery flight because it wouldn't be able to leave the ground. Um, you can make logos with leaves on them in order to show that you're developing sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and I was absolutely delighted to see that Bill was elected to the Royal Society a couple of weeks ago, not least because through him I will be able to try and influence the absolute nonsense the Royal Society has been putting out about sustainable aviation fuel because they're interested in the science of it, which is very good fun, but if you add up how much biomass you need to make today's levels of kerosene, we need to treble our current food harvest. It ain't going to happen. Food productivity is going down anyway with climate change. There is no way that we are going to be flying aeroplanes significantly on biofuel. Uh, the word hydrogen and the word abracadabra are so similar, it's sometimes very difficult to see the difference between them in climate policy. Um, hydrogen could do all sorts of things, but we haven't got any hydrogen. That is the key point about everybody saying they're working on hydrogen-powered anything, whatever it is, there isn't any hydrogen. You have to make it, and you either need a massive supply of emissions-free electricity, or you need carbon capture and storage, and we don't have either of those things. So the future of flight is no flight. That is the only path to zero aviation flying in the foreseeable future. The law of the UK says we will have zero emissions by 2050. There are no offsets. There are no negative emissions technologies available at scale. There are no means to fly within 27 years of now. And nobody has mentioned this in policy. The university has apparently signed up to some date in the 2030s by which it's going to be zero emissions. And I have not heard a single person mention that that means no international students unless they can get here by train or boat. Um, we, we have to face these physical realities that in the amount of time we have left to deliver a safe uh, climate, restraint is going to be part of the menu. Just to cover it off, then here are the emissions of the UK reduced to a set of convenient categories, and I put in whether we influence them at home, at work, or in other places. Um, and there is the only realistic plan we have for reaching zero emissions in the UK uh, within 27 years. So we have to stop flying, eating beef, lamb, and dairy, or anything to do with um, process or fugitive emissions. Most of those are related to oil and gas extraction, so that will happen anyway. Um, for many things, we can electrify them, but we'll only have about half the amount of electricity we'd like to have. We know that because we know how long it takes to build the electricity. And for construction and manufacturing, we don't really have any good so sources of primary material. So we'll only be able to use materials that are electrically recycled. Um, I've ducked out of the biology area, and if you need any advice on that, Bill Sutherland will be happy to meet with you later on. To deliver our good things, we're not talking about poverty. We're not talking about saying to poor people, you can't have what we've got, because the inequality is so severe that it doesn't matter what they do down there the total impact they have on climate change is so small that it simply doesn't matter in the time that we have available. It's these people that matter here. And they're not going to get there by innovation. So it has to come by some decision to embrace restraint. That is the only way that we're going to be able to deliver uh, a safe climate. And when I say that and I raise it in conversation, then it universally gets a version of that reaction. Quite often it's stronger than that, with uh, implications about my mental health and other uh, emotive reactions thrown in. 
Restraint sounds a bit tricky, but against human extinction, hmm, well, I don't know which one I'd prefer, a little bit of restraint or extinction. It seems to me that we should be talking about it. It's the conversation that we've actually got to begin because it's absolutely urgent because we haven't got any other weapons in our armory. So the key question is how do we make more good things happen? How in the wealthy area of the world are we going to be able to embrace restraint? Well, not by following the edicts of conventional economics. Here is the International Monetary Fund's report, and they've plotted welfare at the y-axis and income on the x-axis, and you can see that they're perfectly correlated. Hmm. It's just possible that this graph was drawn by economists who used an economic measure of welfare in order to show that it was correlated by income. Of course, if we could do it, then having more, more money and allowing people to spend it in a way that was compatible with zero emissions with species uh, diversity and with uh, less inequality would be absolutely fine. But over the timescales we've got to act, then these people up here, it's very unlikely that increasing their income is actually going to lead to those outcomes. We actually don't know. What we do know is there's going to be a structural change in the economy uh, to move from a high emitting economy that we have now to a zero emitting economy. And we don't know what the outcome of that will be. In economics language, we don't have the cross elasticities of substituting uh, high emitting activities for low, low ones because it's such a big change in the way the economy works. But we have got a friend in economics who was just down the road at St. John's College, Arthur Alfred Marshall. And in Alfred's great book, The Principle of Economics, he says, economics is a study of humankind. Human life has several aspects. That's quite big thinking, which has been forgotten by most of the faculty now. Human life has several uh, aspects, social, religious, economic, and political, but economics is concerned only with the economic aspect of life. That makes perfect sense. The promotion of welfare is the ultimate goal of economics, but the term welfare is used in a narrow sense to mean material or economic welfare only. We have completely forgotten about that. The people who study PPE at Oxford who end up in positions of, let's call it authority, in what we call a government, um, have done less than a year's worth of, let's call it, study of economics. And they have not understood the assumptions on which the subject is founded. That statement is so clear. And what it tells me is that we need to think about a different idea about welfare. So in pre pre preparation for giving the talk, I've been talking to friends across the arts, humanities, and social sciences. And none of them have any responsibility for what I'm saying, but they were kind enough to give me an hour or two to talk through a range of ideas so I had something to say. And what I say now, I'm putting a major health warning on. Firstly, that they may well not agree. And secondly, the language that everybody uses in their subject is different. The economists are the worst because they've redefined all the words familiar to engineering, like technology and efficiency, to mean something completely different. But across all of our subjects, uh, we all use words in a different and specific way. And I cannot guarantee that I won't say something that appears to contradict the assumptions of your subject. I apologize for that. Please accept my intentions in reaching out. Because from now on, the whole point of the talk is a reaching out to the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Starting with this marvelous poem that Deborah from... Uh, the English faculty gave me, W.H. Auden, poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper, flows on south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in. It survives a way of happening a mouth. And right there is the challenge I've had in most of my conversations between my engineer's instinct that if there's a problem we have to solve it, and the question of whether utility belongs in the arts subjects in a meaningful way or not, in a direct way. Let me try a range of ideas about where we might find different ideas about welfare, different definitions that give us a hint. I mentioned the 88 Pianist Project earlier on, and to do that, we uh, went to 40 primary schools and asked eight-year-olds to design for us an eight-metre-long a uh, finger extension to play the piano from eight meters away. And if you think about that, I've, you've done a lot of creative thinking with the birds, so I won't stretch you again. But if you were here and there was a piano over there, roughly speaking, you would expect either to have a wire to pull or a lever to push. I think those are the two adult, grown-up responses. 
none of the children drew that answer. So here is a way of playing the piano from eight metres away, where you have a cannon, um, <laughs> which is called a canapult, which is a brilliant word, and it fires a rabbit through the air, and it lands on the piano and then goes through a tunnel in the piano and gets a glass of water. And that was so good, we made it as the last note in the piece. So the team of engineers in Sheffield uh, hid from their supervisor and built an eight metre long cannon flying a rabbit through the air to play the last note in the piece. And that's not an exception, it's one of my favourites. But if you look at the 88 Pianist website, you'll see it is fantastic, rich with imagination. And there is a welfare in there that goes beyond anything about income. It's simple joy, actually. I wanted to show you a little bit of a film here, if I can remember how to start it. This is a way of making iron that you may not have seen before. I've got it on the high volume. There. As you can see, if I... Um, just pause the film. This is a, a, a blast furnace, and um, it's in the form of a pregnant woman. She's kneeling. These are her arms. You can see her breasts there, and that's her womb, where the iron is being made from earth. Behind her, the young, uh, lusty men of the village are pumping air into her in four bellows shaped as gonads, and they are singing lewd songs of fertility, because they are giving birth to, with her to iron out of the raw materials of the earth. Um, I found this film uh, incredibly in a meeting in ArcelorMittal in Brussels um, with a, a colleague of my age who'd been brought up in the Congo. And the film was made by a priest who lived there all his life, not particularly, I think, trying to evangelize, just trying to learn and embrace the culture. And he met a tribe who'd maintained this technique uh, and filmed it before they, they lost it, and it's lost now. But this takes us back 7,000 years to when iron was first made. Um, we've archived it on the university repository. It's called Chikunga, if you're interested, uh, or I could email you the link afterwards. And is an absolutely fascinating revelation into human creativity, history. It gives us roots in the past. It tells us something about our relationship to energy, to goods, in a way that we couldn't get from anywhere else. So there is something here about fascination, which is an element of welfare that isn't measured by income. There they are. And I think she's about to have a caesarean section. Oh. And there is charcoal made by the village. Uh, and the, inside that is the iron baby that will be born shortly, uh, of fused solid iron ore. Um, another strand. We've become very excited about the word diversity recently, but I'm worried that we've become interested in diversity by making what we do bland enough that nobody's offended by it. So we've thought of diversity as a diverse range of inputs into a totally non-diverse process, an unvaried process so that nobody's offended. And I think we're missing a trick because when I think about the strength of British cooking, it's precisely that we've embraced a diversity of process and activity. Um, this is a much better, more vibrant idea about diversity, that we have all of these foods from across the world, from different types, and we enjoy sampling and tasting them. We're not trying to make each one serve a meal that doesn't cause offense to anybody. So there's something new about diversity that we could be looking for. And when I spent the evening with Donald McLeod, who presents Radio 3's Composer of the Week, he was very positive about this, saying that that's what the creative arts are about. Life is homogenized. The economies of scale move us towards having very familiar experiences, a hotel room, a car, a road, a traffic light, are pretty much the same world over. And he says the creative arts are about trying to break us out of that homogenization, to wake us up again, into recognizing a diversity of experience. Jackson Pollock as one uh, example. Here's another form of welfare. Um, we already embrace restraint in many fields of life, and in sport it's very obvious. I've chosen javelin because I simply can't imagine anybody going into javelin throwing, hoping to get rich from it. I don't know, maybe there is. Maybe the world champion javelinist 
is a billionaire somewhere around the world looking at his golden pole, thinking how well it all went. But I doubt it. Um, so this guy and uh, all the other javeliners, whatever the verb, uh, the ad what's the part of speech? Noun uh, is uh, for a javelin thrower. Um, they are giving up everything. They go to work only in order to raise money for the calories you need to build javelin throwing arms. And then they get home and they run up and down the garden, chucking bamboo canes over into the garden fence or however you train for javelin throwing. Lifelong. That is years and years of their life is the sole goal of throwing that stick further than they threw it yesterday. That is a huge restraint and sacrificial form of living. And it's something we know about because we know it in other forms of performing arts, in the creative arts, whether it's writing or painting or uh, anything um, uh, plastic, the plastic arts is the phrase, or in, in performing uh, music. Restraint is something we admire and we both enjoy um, doing it in order to improve ourselves, but we also enjoy being in the presence of it, to be in the presence of some world-class expert, the pianist at the bottom right, I happened to hear on Sunday, Emmanuel Axe, and it was the best piano concert I have ever heard. Uh, and it was awesome to be in the presence of somebody who had raised to that peak uh, the, the art that is familiar to all of us. So restraint is a familiar thing in some areas of welfare. I've got a couple more. We had a very good PhD student, Simon, who looked at time, and what we were wondering was whether you could have a form of economics that rather than using money as the unit of exchange, use time as the unit of exchange. So here is a, a week, uh, sorry, a day, uh, for people of different ages. I make this point to the undergraduate engineers quite frequently, that when you think about how much time you study, it's really a very small fraction of the week. There's all that other time that you're not asleep that you could be doing other things with, as you all know so well. Um, but you can see this is quite interesting, that uh, as we get uh, older, we sleep a bit less. Sadly, I think, it takes longer to do washing and eating and to do the household chores. You sort of feel that there's an element of dodderiness being reflected in that uh, other line up there. Um, but the question we were asking was, what does a good life look like? if we use time rather than money as our metric. And well, I don't think we got to the end of it, but this is quite interesting. Over a national survey of time use, this compares um, how much energy we use per minute with how much we enjoy what we're doing. Uh, and I've never dared put this into the public domain because the best activity, the one that we most enjoy, that uses least energy, is sleeping. And I just feel Cambridge professor says we should sleep more to deal with climate mitigation is going to go badly in the press. So I've never dared make anything of that one. But I think there's something there that we could explore further. I have no idea of the story behind this. This is a funeral in Africa. And I took it just to show um, the fact that the cultural diversity around us gives us something we value. There is an element of welfare in appreciating the diversity of experience of expression of the different ways in which we could face the big moments of life that we don't know if we don't go and learn about it and find more out. Um, I think this is the last idea about welfare. I've noticed that um, I don't have a smartphone because I think they're polluting, bad and dangerous. But I've noticed that people who do use them like taking selfies. And if they show you their selfies, they've all got the same facial expression, which says, Good heavens, you won't believe how surprising it is, but I've had an even more exciting time today than I had yesterday. And I gather the originator of this expression was not, none other than Taylor Swift herself. So that is, it seems to me, what all selfies look like. And it's reflecting a sort of aspiration for what a good life looks like. It should be more exciting. Uh, maybe. Well, Charles Dickens, as I understand it, believes that an exciting life is having tea round the fire with your family. That seems to be the destiny of all of Dickens' novels. Um, we could put this in hundreds of different ways about what it is that we value, but people have written surveys of people in their last year of life to ask them what did they most value out of their life, and not a single one of them talks about income. It never comes up. They talk about relationships, about uh, endeavour, about moments that were particular pivot moments where their efforts turned something or somebody did something with them that mattered, but they never ever talk about income at that moment. So welfare is much broader than we've allowed that narrow first year, first term, ill-informed economic definition. 
It's way beyond just income. And if we could actually expand this, if we could raise our awareness and engagement in welfare, maybe that's the way that we could have embraced restraint by seeing other things growing. And income, as we know, may grow or may not, we don't know. But if we only pursue solutions that are compatible with income growth in today's uh, markets, we aren't going to deliver the good things. Well, I'm nearly there. I wanted to give this talk to raise an opportunity. I think there is, uh, well, I'm in the process of applying for money to try and fund a cohort of arts, humanities, and social science PhDs to work with us uh, in the whole area of material restraint, using less materials. I feel in Cambridge we are asleep. We're using our endowment, our incredible resources to deliver the Hogwarts experience with a passion. Um, we have archaic dress codes. Actually, I think I got that wrong. We, it's the men that we make dress in the uh, uniform of colonial uh, chauvinism, not the women. Um, this is a group of people, some of whom you know and are here, and looking at it, you might think that they were going to a fancy dress party, but they're not. They're going to a regular management meeting, and every two weeks they dress up like that to go to a meeting. Now, what's that about? You would think that they might have um, something else to do, but they want to, what they want to do is to dress up like Dementors. And those of you who know your Potter will remember that Dementors are there to suck your soul out before you go into the meeting. More importantly, we've structured ourselves with our schools divided in the traditional science arts divide, and it's not closing. We haven't found good ways of bridging over these two. And I'm desperate for us to do so, because from all the evidence I have, the right-hand side on its own is not going to deliver the three good things uh, that we matter, because the physical solutions just can't be scaled and delivered in time. So I want to end by setting like an agenda. That's what I want to do. I'm an engineer. It's Julian. I thought we Julians ought to stick together, all right. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so I want to make things happen. I want to build solutions. If I see a problem, my instinct is to go and move it, to do something about it. We've got a chasm here. If we start from our familiar positions, take whatever parody you like of it, in my side of it, the typical solution or answer is, we'll invent a solution. And forgive me, whatever it is on the other side, there is no parody I can make, but uh, don't mention utility has among some people in the history faculty, not those here, been a key uh, calling card in their self-identification. What I can say as an engineer, and I'm rare in saying this, is that the rate and scale of delivery is constrained. With the three good things we've talked about, there isn't a technological fix that we can deliver in time. It simply can't be done. And I'm unusual in reaching out to make that statement. What we do know is that welfare and income aren't the same thing. We're absolutely clear about that because that tallies with our personal experience. So it seems to me that where we've got to is to say that survival requires that restraint, that we restrain ourselves, the rich, but welfare can grow while we do it. It's urgent and Cambridge is a place that could allocate the resources, could bring people together in order to try and explore how we bring restraint about, because it isn't going to come without somebody engaging forcibly in the problem to try and bring it a new urgency to reframe it, to re-excite us about welfare and restraint. So in conclusion, I'm hoping that this is the beginning. Thanks very much.